Uh, it's great to be here this afternoon. Thank you very much uh, indeed for coming. And we have two, uh, I, I guess, uh, paradoxical papers to present uh, at the very end uh, of today, and we're looking forward to them very much. So our, our first paper is uh, by Keith Quinton, and he's going to look at the defences uh, of Port Phillip. Let's have a little bit from Bad Keith. So Keith, uh, we understand, spent a lot of his childhood visiting the Swan Island Naval Mine Depot, various heads, uh, fortification, and he's got a, a keen interest in warships and the military fortifications that kept us safe uh, during the 19th century from those pesky, pesky Russians um, and others. He is a volunteer researcher with the Australian Army History Unit at Fort Queenscliff for 10 years. He's authored and uh, published books such as uh, Defending Port Phillip, The Port Phillip Forts, Shortlands Bluff Battery, of course the Stop the Felts in 1914, of course, which was the first British Empire action of World War I. Um, collision, the Marine Inquiry into the loss of the Garangi in 2016. And pertinent to his presentation today, the life and times of John Blackburn, Victoria's defence engineer. Let's give uh, Keith a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm an ex-art teacher and a graphic teacher and this is going to be mostly a slideshow. Um, it's almost kiss and tell because I've got 30 slides for 30 minutes. So here we go. You do without the kiss. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd be queuing up. <laughs> the, I've got two quotes here. Um, one of them, the top one, is from 1885 and the bottom one is from 1892, seven years later. The first one was a statement or a report by Major General Harding Stewart um, to the Victorian Agent General in London, basically talking about the arrival of the disappearing guns at Port Phillip. Prior to this date, the guns were muzzle loading. If you look at that statement and then you look at the second statement, the second one is about a criticism that was made by um, Sir Andrew Clarke in England that too many experts had been involved in designing the forts at Port Phillip. And because there were so many experts, and they were all military officers of course, um, they mucked it up. And Tullock, who was commanding officer of Victorian forts, or forces I should say, um, took great offence to this and wrote a letter to the age. Now, the next one I want to show you, we were looking at people's moustache today, I've cut on everybody. Um, Gilbert and Sullivan, the, the modern Major General. In, in actual fact, what I want you to look at is the top line, the man on the extreme left is the person who made guns. The, the, the great English um, manufacturer of weaponry. Next to him are four key people who came up with the idea of defending the coaling stations that were talked about earlier in the earlier session today. Um, one of them, or two of them, were involved in the attack on Alexandria in 1882 by the Royal Navy, uh, in which the, the seven biggest warships, ironclad warships, the British had, fired 2,000 shells at the defences of Alexandria in Egypt, and they took out 26 guns with 3,000 shells. And there were 260 guns there. So they did a lot of damage to the stone forts, but most of the guns were behind sand embankments. And the naval attack, although it was greatly lauded at the time, was a failure 
what did take Alexandria was a landing force. It was led by the last man in the line, Lothian Nicholson, who was going to come at one stage to be the um, advisor to the Australian colonies on their defences. Instead of Jervis, the man who's on the extreme end over there, um, it looks like it's Jervois, but my friends in Adelaide say he insisted when he was Governor General, his name is Jervis. Next to him is Scratchley, and these were the two men who designed almost all the fortifications around the Australian coastline. They came up with the idea that they needed mines in the water and they needed guns to protect the mines. And if that happened, uh, particularly in Sydney and at Melbourne, then no enemy naval ships could come in. Now, we all know the big fear was the Russians, just like they are today, although probably the Chinese are a bit closer. Next to them is the man that I'm going to talk about today mostly, a man called John Blackburn, and he wasn't a military man at all, he was a civil engineer. Next to him is a man called Harding Stewart, who took over from Scratchley when Scratchley retired from the Australian colonies in 1883, it was Harding Stewart who became the advisor to the Australian colonies right through into the 90s. He, plus the next four men, were responsible for the design of the fortifications at Port Phillip. Two of them, Rose, we've already heard about, uh, the brother of Cecil Rhodes, he was an expert in submarine mines, such an expert that the British Admiralty didn't want to let him come to Australia. And it was at the insistence of the military that he was sent out here. The problem for these guys were that they also had to become the commanding engineer in Victoria. Um, so there was very little time to be able to do the sort of design work that was needed for the defences. The next man, Walker, was the artillerist who picked the guns. Rainsford Hannah replaced Rhodes when Rhodes went back to England and Tullock became the man who completed the fortifications. Very recently I discovered this document, you'll see the cover down the end, the blue cover. It's a secret document um, that was never, as far as I'm aware, ever brought to Australia. There was a copy in the National Archive in Kew, in England. Uh, it's been pinched, so they don't have a copy. Um, and I was, at some point, about five or six years ago, I was able to download a PDF file of the 137 pages. Um, and that now has disappeared as well. I went too close? Oh, all right. Uh, I've just, that's disappeared as well. Um, what it does show is that each of the coaling stations that were built from 1885 onwards, and you can look at the ones on the, the left-hand side over there, um, all had the guns dispersed. These are all breech-loading guns. The guns were dispersed, they were put at different levels, so that an attacking vessel wasn't able to aim its guns directly at the whole barrage of artillery that was being named at. The strange thing is, if you look at the one on the right hand side, which is Port Phillip, there are no guns shown at all. It shows the forts. Um, we've got South Channel. Someone was asking before about Point Franklin. Pope's Eye, which was never built. Swan Island, Queenscliff and Nepean. And then we've got Eagle's Nest, and Crow's Nest, which were basically single gun batteries. What I've done is to produce a graphic that shows where the guns and the forts were able to control the South Channel, which is the one not getting a light at the moment, where am I I've lost the dot? Right. South Channel is the one that comes directly across and then goes up towards Melbourne. West Channel is the one that follows Queenscliff and Swan Island. The 
plan that um, Jervis and Scratchley had was to have a minefield placed where we've got A, which is at South Channel Fort, a minefield up at B, uh, at Swan Island, and then to have a minefield running between Fort Queenscliff and Fort De Pere at D, or C I should say. That was a failure, and it's, from, from my research, what was decided was to place a minefield further in at D, and I'll show you in a moment why. But it says the whole appliances were a profound secret, and the method of working them was known to only engineer officers. As regards the plans of the minefield, only two persons in the colony had ever seen them. Now this is why researchers haven't been able to locate these in the past. This was highly necessary as the whole use of mine defences would be lost were an enemy to obtain an accurate knowledge of where the mines were to be laid. This is Major General Downs writing this in 1900 at the end of all of this. On top of that, we had a Victorian Naval Squadron and if you look at where the minefields are, we've got A, B and, C, uh, a, B and D there, you can see that the naval vessels were basically kept up behind the minefields. Now, this was part of what most people call an integrated defence. There were three torpedo boats with whitehead torpedoes. The whitehead torpedoes had a speed of about 15 knots, which was about the same speed as a ship. They had a range of about 500 metres, so if you wanted to torpedo a, a cruiser coming in the heads, you had to get very, very close indeed. The Cerberus was still in place, and there were two Rendell gunboats, one with a 10-inch breech-loading gun and one with an 8-inch breech-loading gun. There were a cluster of armed harbour truss vessels mounting spar torpedoes. A spar torpedo was a long pole, about 60 feet long, with an explosive charge on the end of it, and you rushed up with your boat at the side of the other boat, hit it, and then backed off as fast as you could and hope you didn't get blown up yourself. Uh, not a very effective <laughs> form of This was, this was the enemy. The top two photos are of Russian corvettes and frigates, normally referred to as protected cruisers. <coughs> the bottom plan is of one of the Orlando-class British cruisers, basically because they couldn't find a cross-section of the Russians. They're all basically the same design. What you have is to get speed for and range for a long distance uh, naval patrols, you couldn't really arm up a whole cruiser or a ship. There was the red line shows what's called the armour belt. That was 10 inches thick and it protected the engine, the boilers and the magazines below that deck and that was below water level. The guns are in the section that's blue and on the top deck above and you can see the plan view with the guns arranged on along the sides on each case. So these were basically around 5,000 to 7,000 tonnes, quite small in today's version of a ship, but they were the best that was going to be put to sea and this is what we were basically trying to protect ourselves against. We're talking about, we all had a laugh about torpedo mines. These were torpedo mines. The, the photograph on the far end is the types of mines that were used before 1885, or 1883 I should say. We didn't really have 
a proper amount of mines bought in and they were kept up on the River Yarra in one of the old convict hulks. And you can see in the bottom image there, a ship called the Deborah. She hadn't been, um, well, she'd been holding convicts since about 1860. Um, and the mines were stored inside. They had no way to get them down to their heads. Um, they had a small practice line of mines they used to put out along the, the waterfront at Williamstown. Um, but nothing until 1885 in the area of the heads itself. The middle section shows three types of mines. <coughs> Number one is what's called a ground mine, sitting on the bottom. The second mine is floating about 20 feet below the surface and it's got a flotation top so that when a ship comes along it hits that buoy at the top that triggers an electrical signal through the land and then someone on the shore is able to throw a switch and blow the mine up or not, depending on whether you're a friend or a foe. The two objects on this end are what are called firing observation um, sites. The bigger one, the fan-shaped one, has got but five contact points so that you could line up five different mines, swing the arm along and when the ship lined up with that particular point then you could press a button and fire the mine electrically so you could control it. Uh, the, the smaller one is just for a single mine. So the Submarine mine um, defences in 1885 to 1892 at the heads totaled about 300 mines and if you look there about a hundred of them were spherical or pear shaped ones that you saw in that hulk. The others were almost all uh, ground mines because Port Phillip's so shallow. So the channels are only about 25 to 20 20 feet in depth, 20 feet on the west channel, about 25 feet in the, the south channel. The mine sat on the bottom, and if the bottom of the ship was within 20 feet, the amount of water would just lift the ship up and probably snap its back, or if it contacted the ship itself, it would blow a hole in the hull. But it virtually had to be in contact to blow a hole. So the idea was to lift the ship up, and basically break its back or disconnect the machinery, the, the drive shafts and whatever. Um, if we look further down to 1896, we can see that there were another 86 mines purchased. So we're looking at 1892 with about 300 and 1896 with another 86 mines purchased. When the first lot of mines were put down in the war scare in 1885 at South Channel, they laid 45 mines across the channel before the scare was over and they decided they had to pull them up again. What had happened was that the electrical cables went to a junction box and then the junction box carried a master cable through to the shoreline at Queenscliff and only four of the 45 mines were still working when they pulled them up. Now this was stated in Parliament uh, and immediately removed from the records and there was a denial made that this wasn't the case at all. Um, it was pretty clear that they needed those submarine mine engineer experts from the UK to sort things out. I spent about uh, 12 years as a researcher at Fort Queenscliff and I never understood what I was seeing. The, the museums in what used to be the underground engine house, I don't know how many of you have been to, to Fort Queenscliff, the room that's now the book room or the, the souvenir room was actually the room, see the, the 
the same as the, the drawing at the top, where the batteries and the switches for the mines were being kept. The small red room was the observation post where those um, fan-shaped sites were being kept. And try this again. Just want to work and know what's going on. There we go. That's where that building was built, and it's still there. It's now labelled um, Asset 34, and it's a 14 pounder magazine. But about uh, four years back at one of the Christmas parties, I persuaded the curator of the museum to take us on a little tour. Mm -hmm. um, and we got inside and found that all the windows are still there intact. It's, it matches exactly that particular building there. <laughs> Um, the centre picture there is of a grid map of Port Phillip Heads. Now most people have never realised that the guns were able to be plotted to fire onto a, a site rather than be aimed through uh, the telescopic sites like at the end. Um, each of the guns also had a telescopic site mounted on top of the um, uh, upper level of the barrel. Um, there's no record in any of the historical documents that I've seen up until recently that these existed. The problem with it was that these were disappearing guns. The carriage was lifted up by hydraulic pressure and the gun percussion shoved the whole thing back down below the surface of the battery again. It also threw off the sight so that you had to jump and try and catch it. Um, not particularly successful, I don't think. But the two sites on the far side were used for plotting ship uh, movement and ship speed, so that you could plot and tell your gun batteries exactly which point to fire at without it actually having them observe where the ship was. This is a graphic of the <coughs> channel between Fort Nepean and Fort Queenscliff and why putting your minefield over there wasn't going to be a, a successful choice. You can see the black part in the middle there. The depth of water is 122 feet, 140 feet, 166 feet, and that's the centre of the channel. Now, I said the mine had to be within 20 feet of the bottom of the ship to do any damage. So, if it sat on the bottom as a ground mine, you have thousands of tonnes of water basically between you and the ship. You're never going to blow it up. I, don't, I doubt it would even get a wave up there much. If you had a flotation device and I was on a cable, then the cable is going to move in the tide. And the tide through that section of the channel is about eight knots. Um, so it, it was just never going to work. Um, this is why the field was moved back onto a line between Pope's Eye Shoal and what's called Observatory Point. Um, under the plans that Jervis and Scratchley had initially um, thought was necessary, they would have had to build a concrete fort like the one at the end. Um, massive and at the time, estimated to have cost about £200,000, which was enormous. It was never going to happen, and instead, what was recommended was the central section here where they were going to put four six-pounder guns onto the breakwater of stone with a line of barges at the rear 
for the magazines and, and stuff um, to be um, able to, to guard the mines from counter mining. Well, the biggest problem with mining was that if you um, dropped a chain, it's a bit like um, the Ukrainian war at the moment. If you, any of you have seen what's going on in Ukraine, the Russians have got a machine that fires a rope of counter mines out over the, the, the land minefields and just blows up all the mines and then the tank drives down that line and gets through the minefield. This is what would have been done um, by any attacking naval force. Um, two types of guns. The top one has got a tangent sight. The bottom one's got the sight that I told you kept up being thrown off when the gun came down. So I put this together to show you the intent of why it was so important to have that forward minefield at, between Pope's Eye and Observatory Point. And you can see that all the guns were concentrated into that area where the ships were going to be held. Um, and that doesn't include the two 9.2 inch guns and two 6 inch guns that would have been put on Pope's Eye Shoal itself. So there was a massive amount of artillery that would have been able to focus on ships that were within one or two thousand yards. Um, this is why Tullock was so insistent that the defence of Port Phillip was quite safe. Now this is the man I really came to talk about. This is John Blackburn, civil engineer. He um, was employed or trained in London by W.M. Ordish and the Ferv, who were a major railway contractor in the English railway system. This is when English railways were expanding um, right across the country, hundreds and hundreds of miles added each year. He then went on to um, work on two docks in the dock lands of the, the Isle of Dogs area on the Thames River. He came for a visit to Australia and then left again after about three months. He must have been very impressed. Um, Melbourne in particular, I can understand why. Uh, went back to England and then headed off to the United States instead and was involved in building... This is not Cairo and Egypt, by the way. It's um, Cairo and Illinois um, to the city called St. Louis. And then he moved on to Fort Point in San Francisco, where he was involved in building a fort near where the Golden Gate Bridge is. Um, I'll show you more of this in a moment. Came to Victoria, was employed by the Public Works Department, built a bridge across the river at Collingwood. Um, then went to Port Wakefield and built a railway between um, Port Wakefield and Wallaroo uh, to get to the copper mines. Then went to New Zealand looking to be a road engineer and got involved in contract disputes and came back to Melbourne. And then in 1882, and I don't know why, he was made assistant to Scratchley. Uh, and basically doing survey work on the fort sites. Um, Scratchley went back to England in 1883. And by 1885, um, Blackbourne was doing all the fortification drawings for Port Phillip. And these are the ones you see around the room today. I want to go through... Scratchley was born in Dover. The top arrow shows the, where his family lived. He, he, his father was one of 13 chemists that worked in Dover at the time. Um, the bottom arrow shows the same building next to the Pent, which was the harbour at Dover. Uh, it dried out during low tide so that there was no water in the Pent and all the boats that were there sat on the bottom so there were no big vessels. The breakwater going out is called the Admiralty Pier and that was where any naval vessels came in and tied up. About uh, less than half a kilometre up the, the way, they built the new railway station that connected Dover to London. Um, and you could go to London in about four hours on a railway train instead of two days on a coach. 
this are the two docks that he worked on. The top one, the Millwall dock, is massive. You can see the size of it here with the excavations going on. What he was doing was working with mass concrete and brick lining. And this is what comes in useful for him when he gets to Melbourne later on. The dock gates, hydraulic dock gates. So he's got experience in hydraulics. When he goes to America, uh, Cairo was where Ulysses S. Grant started his first movement down the Mississippi River against the or against the, the forts that were there. Um, he then went on to Fort Point and worked basically restoring the piles on the piers at first, then got involved in the construction of one of the gun batteries on the upper level of Fort Point. He sacked an Irish foreman um, who was a Civil War veteran and employed Negro labour instead and got into terrible trouble with the American newspapers. Um, also applied for a job in Canada to build forts in Canada when the US was thinking about going to war with Canada and invading across the border. And when he departed, there was uh, a Congress decided that he was a, a, a British spy, um, to which his commanding officer, Charles Seaforth Stewart, said he, he can't possibly be because he promised he wouldn't do it, and he told me he was the son of an English gentleman. <laughs> That's the bridge he built in Collingwood. This is the sort of work he was doing over in South Australia with the railways. Now you can see the huge hundred labourers, they were coming in from England, lasting two weeks on the site, and then heading back to Adelaide again because they wouldn't stay because the work was so hard. Um, but it gave him a lot of experience in building um, sand work. I came across him because of this little scribble over here that's on almost all of these plans. Uh, JB, John Blackburn, and the date he did the drawing. Um, that's the 1885 enlargement of the batteries on Fort Nepean. This is his land survey for the Eagle's Nest battery, the biggest gun that was built in the Victorian defences. That's the plan of the actual battery itself. His drawings are very distinctive, very beautiful. As an art teacher, I just love them. They're just stunning. Two more. Point Franklin battery. Jelly Brown battery. Something like 118 drawings produced in seven years. When I got to 18, you can see each of these has either got one gun or one or two guns uh, in, in the drawing itself. There's never a border around them. They're on the, that's the full edge of the paper. They're huge um, and very recognisable. In 1895, the, the new commanding engineer has said, said to him that um, was, it would be a good idea if they were all connected together and did show the whole forts. And it, you can see the drawing on the far side that was over there that's um, a longer drawing is signed T Hill. Now... Is it that one? That's the one, yeah. That's, that's not one of Blackbourne's drawings. Blackbourne refused to do it unless they got another draftsman in to do the work instead of his own team. And... <coughs> Another one of his drawings, they're just stunning. Um, Fort Nepean is the only one that was produced on that plan in that secret document I was talking about. Yeah, one more. 
there's Blackboard in the circle, and the two men sitting on the side of him were the men who helped you do the drawings. There were three people in that engineering department that produced something like 180 <coughs> defence drawings. Um, remarkable, absolutely remarkable. He went on in 1900 to become um, the first Commonwealth Public Works um, head of department and in 1906 he was at an international uh, a, a Commonwealth uh, symposium on the design of for Canberra, what was to be Canberra, and he suggested that everyone be supplied their lunch and their, their evening dinner from community kitchens via um, hydraulic tunnels that would run around the city. Uh, I don't think they ever did it. Um, so thank you. Uh, look, thank you. Uh, with maybe the hydraulics in Canberra, that system uh, uh, has made up the fact that you can never find a milk bar when you go there. <laughs> I've never been there. No. Oh, <laughs> wise man, wise man. We do have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Hi, John Oscar. I'm a resident of Queenscliff. Almost a local. I've been there 35 yeah. years. Not, not a local. You person. came when I left. <laughs> <laughs> About 30 years ago, an army officer was living down there at the fort. Yeah. Told me, and I don't know where never believed him, it wasn't an artillery officer, it wasn't a guard, and he said the reason for the, or the design of the fort itself was not to stop people getting in, it was to stop people getting out. So once they were in the bay, they would shoot at them and force the boats and ships that were inside to heave to. Uh. Is that factual or is that rubbish? If, if you think about the idea that those three minefields were there, and they were the main part of the defence, then it was to stop people getting in. Yeah. Now, once you were trapped in that fire, to turn around and get out again was incredibly difficult, and your chances of getting out again with six 9.2 inch guns, two 10 inch guns, three 8 inch guns, six 6 inch guns, all firing at you, of course you couldn't get out again. Yeah. And that was why in 1992, Tullock wrote, that the fence was intact and couldn't be <coughs> penetrated. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, my guess on a brief one. You mentioned the uh, much like the Brennan torpedo. Yeah, the, the Brennan Australian invention. Yeah, we talk about that. Yeah, the, the the Brennan torpedo was invented by an Irishman who was um, sponsored by the engineer in charge of Melbourne University's engineering department <coughs> to um, produce a. a a torpedo that could be guided and it was run by two drums inside the torpedo and two piano wires that ran about for about two kilometres long and you had two engines and you could pull it, you could make it into a guided missile by revving your engines one side or the other. Um, it was taken to the UK, it was developed as a weapon and there were, I think, four Britain torpedo stations built in the UK. There's one still exists in Hong Kong. They were viable guided missile torpedoes. Um, remarkable, didn't it? Yeah, well. absolutely remarkable. Thank you. Oh, we had to ask just one more. Yep. Final question, here we go. Just a quick comment. The uh, South Channel Ford yep. served Victoria post uh, defence fortifications role. Yep. Uh, 60 years ago, I saw explosives being taken out of a magazine on the South Channel Fort by crew members of the SS RIP, XHMAS Whaler. They were used in the blasting in the heads, and that blast, that channel, that process of knocking out sandstone vehicles in the RIP, the entrance, occurred something over 90 years, I believe but it's definitely in the early 1960s the explosives were stored in the magazine on the South Channel Fort and they were used in that process. That's, I mean, when you get large amounts of explosive like that, all the mines that were kept at Swan Island, 
you want them as far away as possible from yeah, public. people, the public, yeah. And, and the ones on Swan Island were really remote. South Channel Fort was absolutely remote. Totally. Yeah, totally remote. Yeah. Uh, what a piece of information we've had. What magnificent drawings uh, we've had. And now, Jim, you'll be writing a paper on submarine mining. I can yeah. see <laughs> he's taking notes already. Yeah. Hey, thank you for uh, the wonderful talk that you've given, that magnificent slideshow. And on behalf of the uh, MWH3, thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks.